starting 2 Peter. Uh, last week was an introduction to the book. Now we're actually going to get into the text and work our way through. And I'm just going to be covering the first four verses here. We're going to be talking about God's great gifts to us. You ever see children on Christmas morning? I actually have a video later on in the message about kids opening their gifts that they got on Christmas. Uh, we should be excited about the gifts that God has given to us, as excited as what these kids are on Christmas morning. All right, but first we're going to start off with my humorous anecdote of the day. It's one about a gift. A husband buys his wife a car for Christmas. It was a nice family style car. I don't like it, she says. I want something that goes from zero to 160 in three seconds. So he comes back with a bathroom scale and says, stand on there. <laughs> ah, that's what she wants. That's what she gets. Something that will go from zero before she stands on it to, I maybe should have changed that to 300, oh, I don't know. All right, so let's get into our, oh. Peter reminded me, get it, reminded me, that reminding you, repeating myself, there's nothing wrong with that. Because he had in a couple of messages, we're gonna have, we're gonna talk about Peter's ministry of reminding. There's nothing wrong with reminding people of things. So we've gone over some of the history of Peter, uh, even last week. But real quickly, uh, I say a history lesson here. Nero came to power in A.D. 54. At first, he did not start a persecution of Christians. It is said, most historians believe this, that he hired to some to burn down the ghetto areas of Rome so that he could build a larger palace. So he liked to build monuments, monuments to himself. And, and so he needed an area cleared. And uh, so he hired, supposedly hired some people to burn down the ghetto areas of Rome. Then, to deflect accusations on himself, that kind of created an uproar. There were a whole lot of people out of, without homes, and they were, you know, oh. so he needed to deflect accusations against himself, so he blamed the Christians. All oh, this new sect that had come to Rome and weren't worshiping the Roman gods anyway, and so he said that they did it. So he started a, a persecution against them. Also, he wanted to be considered a god. Several um, Nero, several uh, Caesars before him had started that. Actually, Augustus Caesar started it, claimed his dad Julius Caesar was God. Augustus Caesar claimed to be the son of God. Isn't that interesting? Nero is carrying this on that the Caesar is really God and the Christians would not bow down to him so he persecuted the Christians for that. All of 1 Peter was about that. So between AD 65 and 68, a great persecution broke out against the Christians. It is commonly held by Bible scholars, many, many of the church fathers have attested to this, that both Peter and Paul were martyred during this persecution. Tradition holds that Paul, shortly after writing 2 Timothy, was fed to the lions. The Colosseum was not yet built under Nero, but they still practiced this in smaller venues around Rome, and Christians were fed to the lions as one of the means of, of martyrdom. Um, and Peter, shortly after writing 2 Peter, was crucified upside down because he felt unworthy to die like his Lord. Okay, so some of the background again. Last week we talked about this. Peter wrote it. Uh, recipients seem to be the same recipients of First Peter. In First Peter, he mentions five or six provinces that he is sending that letter to. This seems to be the same thing. They were the farthest reaches of the Roman Empire, and he wanted to get the letter out to them. Purpose, he knew he would soon be put to death and wanted to warn them of false teachers. I've mentioned that a couple of weeks now. Who would creep in among them and bring false doctrine. All right, here's today's text. So here's uh, beginning, of first, uh, beginning of 2 Peter chapter 1. He says this. 
Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given to us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us, given us, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, through these promises, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. So here was a, a whole list. Peter starts off his book of 2 Peter with listing a bunch of blessings, a bunch of grace, a bunch of gifts that God has given to us. I don't know if you picked up one of my pretty, wonderful, blank-filled sheets out there. Uh, I know, with such a large crowd, they were probably all gone by the time you got here. And, but uh, I hope you got one. Here's my outline. You can fill in the blanks as we go here. Number one, a like precious faith. A like precious faith. Point number two, grace and peace. God has given to us grace and peace. And Peter's wish is that it would multiply, it would grow. Everything we need for life and godliness. I'm going to spend some time on point number three. Peter says he has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Point number four. He has given to us very great and precious promises in his word. Point number five, he has allowed us to participate in the divine nature. And point number six, he enables us to escape the corruption of the world. All of those are promises, gifts that God has given to us as believers. Okay, point number one, a like precious faith. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, here's the promise, has received a faith as precious as ours. Peter was a great leader of the early church. He had great faith and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says... This letter is going to those who have also received uh, a faith that is as precious as what his is. Here's, uh, faith actually has two meanings, if you look it up. Marion Webster, so it it's, uh, it's has a credible source here. This isn't just me spouting off. This is right from Marion Webster. The noun form of it is to, or the verb form of it is to believe and trust in the loyalty of God, right? to trust in God, right? It's an act, it's an action, it's a verb. But it's also used as a noun. It can refer to that which you believe in, that body of truth. Who Jesus Christ is, the fact that he died on the cross for you. So it can be used as a verb, it can be used as a noun. I mentioned here, Peter uses it as the noun here. He refers to the content of their faith, their knowledge, their belief, their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Precious as ours. Some of the translations translate it as like precious faith. Huh? That's an interesting word. Iso, that prefix meanings uh, equal to, and timos, uh, something that is precious or valuable. We're going to look at that word a little bit farther in the sermon because he uses it of the precious promises that we have. Okay, Something that is valuable, of equal value. Their faith is just as valuable as that of Peter or Paul. You know, uh, we always think of uh, the Billy Grahams or the Luis Palau's. They have a lot of great faith, and then there's just little old me who am kind of a peon in God's kingdom. No. 
we have the same kind of standing with God as what these giants in the faith have. Anyone who believes in Jesus can have the same blessings of salvation and eternal life. Eternal life is not just for the privileged, but for any who will believe in him. Here's the Amplified translation. I liked that. I often go to the Amplified because, uh, now, you know, you have, you have translations that try to translate it word for word for word, you know, and that's kind of difficult uh, because some Greek words got kind of a whole long meaning to them and it doesn't come through. Some translate idea for idea, okay, that helps, you know, some, but Others um, are, are paraphrases, like the Living Bible and, and the Message. Those are paraphrases where the author has said, well, to me, it kind of means, you know, and they expand on it rather nicely. The Amplified is a nice translation because it literally takes the meanings of the words and kind of expands on them. Though it is a longer translation, it is not a paraphrase. It just amplifies the meaning of words. Here's what he says here, the author of the Amplified. 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 says, Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained, you know, here's, here's the word I was looking at, a faith of equal standing with ours. That's what that word means. A faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I, I like the way that translates it. Your faith, your standing with God is just as valuable, just as precious, just as important to God as what we might consider the real giants of the faith. What a gift that is. Second gift Peter talks about, a gift from God, is that we have received his grace and peace. Grace and peace be yours in abundance there, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Comments on grace. Another great gift the Lord has given to us is that we have his grace. Now, if you study that word grace, it is a big word in the Bible. Huh? Any uh, literal meaning, do I say it? Grace is defined as any blessing that the Lord gives to us as, as human beings. Okay? Now, theologically, this, these aren't biblical words, but theologically, um, theologians have put grace into two different categories, and there's a whole bunch of categories that they put it in, but two categories that are opposing one another. The first one is called common grace. Common grace is God's goodness, God's blessing, God's grace unto anybody. Any reprobate, <laughs> any, all of mankind, okay? That's God's grace. We don't recognize that. You know, we, the, I got some verses that talk about that. Common grace, God's goodness to everybody. And then special grace, God, special grace, God's goodness given to believers only in Jesus Christ. So there's a couple of, uh, trying to make a distinction here between grace. Peter, uh, well, let me talk about common grace. Psalm 145, 9, look what it says. The Lord is good to all, to all, saved and unsaved alike. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Common grace, God's blessing on mankind. Oxygen to breathe, a home, a uh, uh, whatever other blessings, uh, you know, we all, we have great blessings from the Lord. That's considered grace. Here's another one, Matthew 5, verses 44 through 45. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Notice this. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. You got two farmers. One's a believer, one's a non-believer. And through the summer, there was a lot of sun, there was a lot of rain. And in the fall, both the saved farmer and the unsaved farmer have an abundance of crops. Well, that's God's grace, common grace, okay? 
Now, special grace is grace that is given to believers. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8, you know that verse, well-known verse that we often quote? For by grace, there it is, you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. Grace given to us as believers because we placed our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's another verse that talks about special grace. Oh, that's our text today. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Peter says, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and, the, and of Jesus Christ our Lord. We often sing that song, count your many blessings, see what God has done. I didn't, I'm not very good without the music behind me. I'll have Lee sing that sometime. Yeah. <laughs> But we need to do that. We need to consider the blessings, the grace that God has given to us. Most common grace, uh, everyday blessings we have, and then the special grace that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, the gift of God. In abundance, Paul, uh, Peter says in that verse, uh, the grace and peace be to them in abundance. Comes from the word pleth. Thuno, to increase, to multiply. You think of any English word that sounds like that. We get the English word plethora. Have you ever heard of a plethora? Plethora comes from the Greek, this Greek word. Uh, I'm looking at the history of the English word plethora, originally this English word was a medical term. Now this was back when medicine wasn't very, very advanced yet. And uh, it meant an excess of bodily fluids. One of the treatments they had in those days was to uh, put, either put leeches on you to suck blood out or to drain blood out of you by cutting you and draining blood. Why? Because they felt you were sick because you had an excess of bodily fluid. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Well, that's what the word plethora comes from. But then it came to mean, you know, any large or excessive amount of something. Peter says, I, it is my prayer for you, it is my wish for you. He's giving them this blessing that God's grace and peace would be in a large and excess amount into our lives. Huh? Isn't that neat? Peter wants his recipients to have the grace and peace of God in a great abundance. He wants the grace and peace that they already have to grow and to multiply. Not necessarily found in that word, but multiply is greater than just growing. If you got three plus three, three plus three is six. I know, I had to tell her. She was thinking, she had her hands up there. and was kind of, Three times three is Greater than that. Now, if I were to take 27 plus 27, you got 54. But 27 times 27, I don't even know what that is without my calculator. You know, so multiply. Peter wants the grace to be multiplied in their life. 2 Corinthians 9.10 says, He supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. He's going to multiply that grace, that seed that he's given to us. Point number three, and this I think is, is the key to the message. Peter wants the readers to realize this. Verse three, his divine power has given us Everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his glory and goodness. His divine power has given to us what? Everything we need for life and godliness. That's an amazing statement. Uh, some comments I say about that has given to us everything we need for life and godliness. What an amazing gift from God. When you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, 
You were born again. You received the Holy Spirit. You received a beginning understanding of the Word of God. All kind of forgiveness. Uh, you've received all kinds of blessings. Importantly, you have received everything you need to grow into a strong, mature, godly Christian. You already have it. He's already given to us everything we need to live a godly life. When a Christian says, I just can't overcome the sin in my life, he's wrong. Peter says, we have everything we need, we just don't use it. You know? I missed my button. I lost my button. Here it is. Peter says, we have what we need. Um... I have at home right now on my basement floor my washing machine in about a hundred different parts spread out there. The bearings had gone out on my, what do you call it, tumbler, tum, uh, uh, drum, and it was making a horrible, horrible noise, and we called uh, Ron's Repair, and the guy came out, and he said, yeah, your bearings are shot, we need to order the kit, and I'll come back. What did he come back? Thursday, I think he came back. And he came back Thursday with the kit that he had ordered, and he got into it, and pretty he had it all apart. Pretty soon he comes upstairs, and he begins to explain to me. Um, he says, for this, the manual said that this kit was supposed to be for your dryer, but the shaft that goes from the motor up to the, to the drum is only this long. But you have on your drum a bell shaped, and that means that the shaft to go from the motor up to the, up to the tumbler, up to the drum, needs to be about six inches longer. They did not have, in the kit that he ordered, says it was the right kit, they did not have everything that was needed to repair that washing machine. So he says he's going to go order it. He left. It's strewn all over the floor. He's going to come back Tuesday afternoon because the part, <coughs> you've heard this, the part should be in by then. The correct part. In the kit that he ordered, it did not have everything needed to repair the wash machine. That's not true with what God has given to us as Christians. It has everything packaged in it. It has everything we need for life and godliness. Here's a cross-reference, 1 Corinthians 10.13. 1 Corinthians 10.13, you memorized that years ago. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Yours isn't unique. Everyone goes through these same temptations. God is faithful. I like, that. I like that little phrase in there. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. There is no temptation too strong that you need to be overcome by it and yield to it. Peter says we have everything we need for life and godliness. Here's another one, 2 Corinthians 10.4. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. Okay, They're not, you know, just fleshly, physical things, but have divine power, notice this, to destroy strongholds. Now the word strongholds, uh, when you see it, it refers to back when the enemy would attack you, you could go into a stronghold and it would be like a fort, it would be like a, I, I saw a couple of days ago on TV about castles and uh, the, the, the way castles were used to defend, you know, and um, you might go into a fort, you might go into a castle so that the enemy cannot overcome you. Back in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, it talks about the Lord is our stronghold. But here's a verse. Paul is talking about that you have allowed sin to creep into your life. You have let that sin be there. You have practiced that sin. That sin has gotten handholds and grips in your life. And that sin is now very difficult, very rooted in your life 
to get it out of your life. But Paul says the weapons, the abilities, the spiritual grace that God has given to us is able to tear down and to destroy those strongholds of sin in your life. You have everything you need. No, no, Lord, I've let sin get this stronghold in my life and I just can't, I just can't, give, I, I can't get rid of it. Peter says you have everything you need to live a godly life. There's no excuses. We just need to use them. And I know, people, I'm not yelling at you. I'm actually yelling at me because I know I got things that I practice over and over again. And I say, wait a minute. Peter says, the Bible says, I have the ability to overcome that. I just need to use it. I need to use the weapons of our warfare, spiritual weapons, to overcome the strongholds that are in my life. Ephesians 1, 3, very similar to what Peter said. Blessed be the God and Father of our, of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Again, we have everything we need to live a life of godliness. All right, point number four. We have very great and precious promises in his word. He says in verse four, the first part of verse four, through these, through the ability to overcome, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. Where is he given to us? He's given to us, given them to us in his word. Let's look at a couple of the words here. Uh, the word that's translated as precious, it's to me, valued, precious, of great price, honored is the definition of it. Interestingly, do you know what an etymologist is? Not an entomologist, an entomologist studies insects. An Etymologist studies the where our words come from. I was looking at the etymology of this word. Uh, some believe it came from an old Germanic term, but others believe it, our English word for time has come from the Greek word, which means precious. Isn't, isn't that kind of interesting? Our time is valuable. Our time is precious. Once you've wasted it, it's gone. It can't be reclaimed anymore. It is important to use our time wisely. I, I thought that was interesting. The next word for great, we have great and precious promises, is magista. This is a Greek word, uh, mega, meaning large, great, in the widest sense, and great, broad, our English word, magistrate. You ever gone before a magistrate? That means you went before a judge. Somebody who's of great importance is the word magistrate. So we have great, we have majestic promises, and we have valuable promises given to us in the word of God. All right, comments on this verse. Another great and valuable gift from the Lord is the promises we find in his word. Be careful, not all of the promises are for us as New Testament believers. The Lord promised Sarah at age 90 she was going to have a child. That's not your promise. <laughs> you don't need to worry that when you get to be 80 years old that you're going to have a child. Okay, that was for a specific purpose. Some of them are for Israel and not for us. But I say there are so many Precious promises that are for us. We can claim these promises from the Lord. Here's some promises. I got some references. I don't know if you want to write these references down. Uh, God promises, I will be with you. Okay, Hebrews 13, 5. He says, I will be with you. God promises, I will protect you. Psalm 20, verse 1 says, I will protect you. God promises, I will be your strength. Isaiah 41.10, I will be your strength. God promises, I will answer you. Matthew 7, verse 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about prayer. He promises that God will answer our prayer. I will provide for you. Philippians 4.19, you know that, that one. 
Philippians 4, 19, I will provide for you. I will give you peace. 2 Thessalonians 3, 16. And the last one, probably the most important one, I will always love you. 1 John 4, 16. And this is just a handful. This is just, a, actually this came from, it came from some meme somebody had put on Facebook that I, <laughs> that I saw. And I said, hey, that goes along with my message this week about the great and precious promises. So I copied it out, typed it in uh, my sermon. These are great and precious promises that we have from the Lord. Here's a story. An old story, an old story tells of a local minister who was visiting an older member of his congregation in her home. As they talked, the minister opened his Bible and began to share some passages of scripture with the older woman. She followed in her Bible, which was well worn and contained much writing in the margins. The minister noted the, the, the used condition of her Bible, and upon examining it, he found next to many passages, he found the letters T and P written in the margins. Thinking this somewhat strange, he inquired as to the meaning. Oh, pastor, the lady says this, those are my promises that I've marked. This old saint responded, T and P simply means I've tried them and they've proved right. Tried and proved. God promises many things to us in his scripture. Here's cross-reference. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That goes along with what Peter said earlier, that we have everything we need to live a godly life. The precious promises of Scripture can teach us and train us and equip us so that we can do good works for the Lord. Point number five, we are allowed to participate in God's divine nature. Verse 4, the second part, B, says, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Participate. The Greek word koinonos, a sharer, partner, or companion. We share in having the, a divine nature. Being a new creature when we become a believer in Jesus Christ. We, need, we become born again. We have a new nature, a divine nature from God. We participate, we share with God's divine nature. Now that doesn't mean we are gods, you know, but it does mean that God has given to us a new nature which wants to serve him. It's interesting, this participate comes from a similar Greek word, koinonia. You've heard that one probably when we talk about, let's have a potluck and a fellowship together. Well, that's where that Greek word is, koinonia. And this one is very uh, similar to that. Koinonia is the feminine form of it. Koinonos is the masculine form of it. They had masculine and feminine in the Greek language. We can participate in the blessings, the divine nature of God. Cross-reference, John 3, 3. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night because he was a ruler, a leader in Israel's religious people. And so he came at night so all of his cronies wouldn't see him. And he asked Jesus about who he was. And Jesus says this. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Being born again, receiving that divine nature, that new nature that God gives us. 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be, here it is, born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead. One more cross-reference. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You may have memorized this one in your background. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old has passed away, behold, the new has come. Good, good cross-reference, what Peter is talking about here, that we can participate in the divine nature. Lastly, I'm watching my time, I know. 4C, the last part, and we can escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. 
Couple of Greek words that are used here. Escape, we get to escape. Uh, I won't even pronounce that. Apo, apo, fugo. To flee from, escape, break out of forced captivity. Sin wants to make us captive. It wants to make us slaves. Peter says we have escaped the corruption of the world. Corruption. It's interesting. Try to pronounce that. Greeks could put a PH sound and a TH sound together. In English, we, we, don't, we don't have that. You know? so, <laughs> um, uh, so there's the word. Uh, Phthora. Corruption, destruction, decay, rottenness, decomposition, ruin, deterioration. That's what the world wants to do to our lives. I remember as a kid, uh, this just sticks, this memory sticks out in my mind. As a kid, we were walking I don't, down the road, and we always had dogs, and the dogs would always come with us. I and my brothers were walking down the road, and there was a skunk that had gotten hit by a car, but it had gotten hit by that car several days before, and it was summer, and it was hot, and it had been laying on the asphalt, and so it was not only a stinky skunk, but it was a deteriorating stinky skunk. But our dog loved it. Before we could stop him, our dog ran over there, rolled in the thing, rolled all over, had a good time just rolling in that thing, and then got up and continued with, on, with us on the way home. <laughs> What a smelly, stinky dog. We dumped him in our cow tank, gave him a bath right away. Uh, uh, the world is like that dead skunk. Uh, the world wants to make us like that dead skunk. It wants us to deteriorate. I say here, the corruption of the world, the sinfulness that is in the world causes mankind to decay, deteriorate morally, socially, physically, I say, just look at the life of an alcoholic or a drug abuser or a gambling addict. Look at the relationships that maybe a sex addict has. They're, they're deteriorated. They're destroyed. They're, the, the world wants to do that to us. Peter tells us that being a believer helps us to escape that corruption that the world wants to bring in our lives. We can escape it. We can break free out of that. To break away from the captivity that sin brings in our lives. Cross-reference, 2 Peter 2.19. Going to be farther on in this book. Peter is referring to the false teachers. Remember the book is talking about false teachers. Peter says this about those false teachers. He says, they promise them freedom. The people that they're preaching. Promise them freedom. But they themselves are slaves of corruption. They're they're. They're captive to the corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. But we, as believers, have been set free from that. Remember, we have everything we need to live a godly life. All right. You got to see this. <laughs> He's happy about the paper ripping. All right, we need not finish that. But my point is, these kids are so excited over the gifts that they've gotten for Christmas. People, we should be that excited about the grace, the blessings, the gifts that God has given to us in our spiritual lives. He has given us Everything we need to live a godly life. We ought to go, yay, whoopee, that's exactly what I wanted.
good. We should be excited about that. All right. Why is Peter reminding us of all of these blessings that God has given to us? Well, remember, Peter is combating false teaching that was creeping in. False teaching, false teachers would pervert the gospel, would add things to us. That's why Peter says, true Christianity has everything you need to live a godly life. The false teachers were going to creep in and they were going to say, oh no, you've got to have this special knowledge or you've got to follow this or you've got to do good works. Peter is saying, no, you already have everything you need to live a godly Christian life. By reminding us of all we have in Christ Jesus, we should leave, why? I say, why should we leave the truth for something less? than what God has already given to us. Let's sing this. And can it be?